No, that's what it's like. Everyone. We're just we're a small group, and I hear that other people probably will trickle in, but I think that we should be going just because I want to respect the time of everybody. So, good evening. <laughs> My name is Victoria Christman. I'm a professor in the history department here, and I also direct the Center for Ethics and Public Engagement. Um, I'd like to welcome you all this evening to an event that really embodies the mission of the Centre, which is, in part, to prepare students for lives in which they serve for distinction, with distinction for the common good, which, if you listen to NPR, is our tagline for Luther College all the time. It's my great pleasure this evening to introduce a man whose entire career has been devoted to doing just that, and who has a long history of generously sharing his gifts with our community here at Luther College. Originally from Norway, Steiner Brin pursued much of his education right here in our backyard. Not our front yard, though. But he had a BA and MA, has a BA and MA from the University of Wisconsin, and a PhD from the University of Minnesota. So he's basically circled Luther College during the course of his educational career. Today he comes to us from the Nansen Center for Peace and Dialogue in Lillehammer, Norway, where he's worked for almost 30 years, and now serves as the senior advisor and head of the Nansen Dialogue Network. In that role, he's participated in dozens of inter-ethnic dialogue seminars in some of the world's most war-torn areas. He's worked most extensively in the Balkan regions, but has also been part of peace dialogues in the Middle East, Somalia, and Ukraine for which work he's received dozens of prestigious awards and has been nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. His team just learned this week that they've been entrusted by the Macedonian government with the creation of a dialogue-based education system for that country, the whole country. I'm tremendously grateful to Dr. Bryn that in the midst of a schedule that can only be described as completely insane, He's willing to make the time to share this part of his story with us this evening. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Steiner. Thank you for those uh, nice words. When we look at the world, Syria, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan, the Middle East, it somehow looks like, you know, we can't stop these wars. And when wars are continuing like that, we are allowed to ask, when so much energy, when so much resources are going into peacemaking, but so little peace is coming out, is it maybe something wrong with our approach? And to summarize my 25 years of experience working with dialogue, I would say, yes, there is something wrong with the approach. Dialogue and reconciliation between people are a missing part. We trust too much to try to build states and strong institutions, and we somehow neglect the importance of bringing people back together after the conflict. So what I've been doing, a little bit by coincidence, because in 94, my hometown organized the Olympics, so we connected with uh, Sarajevo. We asked ourselves, how can we contribute? Well, I worked at an academy which is kind of similar to Luther College, just much smaller. We have 70 students, you have... Just over 2,000. Uh, oh, you're, big, you're like Manhattan. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided to invite people to come and sit and talk. Can we rebuild cooperation, <coughs> trust? Can we establish a basis for, for cooperation? after what happened. And for five years, I was sitting three months at a time. That's a long conversation. So whenever you hear about a couple that want to break up, have a divorce, ask them, have you had a long conversation? <laughs> and if they ask you, what do you mean? Well, three months. People don't have that time anymore. People don't have time for peacemaking. For, because to rebuild relationships take Time. To rebuild trust takes time. There are no shortcuts to reconciliation, but there are absolutely roads to reconciliation. But probably we have to think generational. And you told the nice news, and since we have a woman from Kosovo here, I want to just repeat it, that in Macedonia we have succeeded with an intercultural curriculum, which means that in all Albanian areas, 
All the Macedonians must learn Albanian, and the Albanians must learn Macedonian. And it's so easy for kids to learn languages. But when we have conflicts, we very often see that the vision of society also influences language skills. I've been visiting Ukraine 13 times the last three years, and I see from year to year how Ukraine is dividing. People in the East are stopping to teach their children Ukrainian language, people in the West are stopping to teach their children Russian language, and the children are the losers, because they actually used to have two mother tongues. Now they only have one. So the movie you will see is interesting, because I started with dialogue seminars in 95 in Lillehammer, but very fast, two women from Pristina, Arietta and Sneshana, said, that's too exclusive. We need to have these seminars here, with our friends, our colleagues, family, neighbors. And already in the fall of 97, we had the first local dialogue seminars, with the seminar between Serbs, Albanians, in Herzegnovi, in Montenegro. And people were amazed. They were amazed what they actually could accomplish. That was not three months, it was only three days. But they said, wow, this is the first time we've been sitting together for three days. And then the filmmaker, he comes to me and he asks, can I come and film a dialogue seminar? And I said, no, that's impossible. You cannot film a dialogue seminar. You can only film a dialogue seminar that's being filmed. And that's something else. He said, I'm not so sure about that. I will come with you without camera. And he did in November 98. Then he came with the camera, and he was right. There wasn't much difference. It was almost the same thing. He made the movie of a seminar in March 10th to 12th, 1999, and the war started, well, the war started actually earlier, but the bombing started on March 24th, 12 days later, in 1999. Then he went on to other projects, and 10 years later, he asked me, where are these people now? Can we find them? So he starts a process, and he finds them. 10 of the people that participated in the first movie and gathered them in the same hotel, Plaza in Herzegnov in Montenegro, and shows them the film from before the war. And they start to talk, was it worth it? Do we now have the society we were dreaming about? And so forth. The film is not a commercial for dialogue. It doesn't show how efficient dialogue is. It actually shows how difficult it is. But what it shows very good is how different perception people who live in the same place might have of the same reality. We were talking about that earlier today when we had a meeting between uh, Democrats and Republicans. And how is it possible to have such different perceptions of the same reality? That's what dialogue is about, to explore that. What kind of teachers, what kind of experiences, what kind of grandmother, what happened to me in my life that made me think that this is right and that is wrong? And, of course, if in Kosovo you're born into a Serbian family, you're born into a certain Serbian way of looking at things. If you're born into an Albanian family, you're born into an Albanian way of looking at things. Basically, with the language you learn, but not only the language, also the history, the stories you hear from your parents, your grandparents, from before you're going to school. Enemy images are often shaped when you're two, three, and four years old. If you're born in a Palestinian village, you learn to hate Israelis before you know what's going on. And the movie shows these different perceptions of reality, at the same time, you can see that there are some movement. There is some kind of relationship building between, between the people. But when people from Kosovo see the movie, they often look at what is wrong. Because the movie has two voices. It has a Serbian voice and an Albanian voice. And my experience is, if we want to understand conflicts, if we want to contribute to solve conflicts, we need to understand the other. We need to spend time to understand the other, not because truth is relative and so forth. But if we don't listen to that other story, 
how can we, how can we really deal with the conflict? This sounds maybe to you like common sense, but I learned, uh, and uh, you're fortunate, uh, I heard about uh, all the freshmen that had to read this book by the Armenian author. And she describes very well, when you're born into the Armenian community, you learn to hate Turks and Turkey. And all freshmen have to read her book here at Little College. And she even starts just by describing. When I went to Istanbul, I discovered it was a place. And it's actually kind of a beautiful place. But she was so raised to hate everything Turkish without having that experience and having that, that knowledge. So this is what is lacking in international peace building. Spending time trying to understand the other. I went to Yerevan in Armenia. I had this booklet with me to understand the other. I had to remove it after a few hours because people really felt, are you accusing us? Are we the problem? Because we don't understand the Turks. Is that the problem after what they did to us? The same, of course, in, in Palestine, Palestine. Is that the problem that we don't understand the Israelis? Well, it is actually part of the problem. And part of the problem in Kosovo is that Albanians don't want to try to understand the Serbs. And the Serbs don't want to try to understand the Albanians. They just want to accuse each other, blame each other for everything that happened. And they pass the conflict on to their children. I'll be here after the movie. So uh, let's watch. And just two words about the background, because we see this conflict in many places in the world. You have a people A, you have a people B, and people A are the majority, and they're discriminating against the people B. <coughs> you often then think, why should we be a minority in your country if you don't respect us, if you don't see us, if you don't treat us like human beings? We'd rather be a majority in our own country. The problem often is that when you become a majority in your own country, the new minority is not treated well. Because we, the people, we tend to divide in us and them. And when there is a conflict, we are right and they are wrong. So when we are the majority, and we have the power, and we are right, and the minority doesn't have power, it's a very bad starting point for the minority. So of course, any minority would prefer to be a majority in their own country. But not every people can get a country. We have to somehow learn how to live together. And that's what the movie is about. I fight for my rights, for my freedom. You won't, because this is not your country, this is not your place. This is not my country. No, no. No, wait a second. What's Please. Serbia then? What's Please. Serbia? Please. Serbia is consistent of Kosovo, Vojvodina, Šumadija, Mačva, West Serbia, Nebotinska Krajina. And I make no difference between Kosovo and Serbia. He is afraid of me. We have no, we have no guns. No, we haven't even, only kitchen knives. Everybody knows that every single Serbian family had a, has a gun in it, at least. What? No, no, no. No, no, no. Hi, I'm Jun. You might not remember me after all this time, but I'm the one who made the film about the meeting between you Serbs and you Albanians from Kosovo in the spring of 1999. At that time, your country was at the brink of war. The Albanian Liberation Army, KLA, had during a short period of time become a threat to Serbian control of Kosovo. Under President Milosevic's command, Serbian police and military forces were sent to Kosovo to fight back Albanian guerrillas. In the countryside, civilians from both sides were killed and forced to leave their homes.
when massacres in Albanian villages were discovered, NATO feared systematic genocide by the Serbian regime and threatened with military intervention. In the capital, Pristina, where you all lived, Albanians demanded an end to Serbian oppression. Serbs from Kosovo demonstrated against Albanian separatism. There were violent clashes between Serb and Albanian students. At that time, you lived separate lives and didn't have any contact with each other. I was surprised when I heard that the peace movement organized meetings between the two groups. Now, as everything was falling apart, you decided to meet your enemy. You left Pristina to meet in a hotel in Montenegro. Maybe from my side, like to give to give them my point of view and my thoughts, and uh, to tell them what my life is, because I don't think that they know what our life is and has been for the last ten years. I don't know. I don't know exactly how do they think. So I can find out that that's a good place to find out. People are scared, and they have kind of fear for the future. You can sense it everywhere. You can see it, feel it everywhere you go. I remember that you Serbs feared that an Albanian independence would force all Serbs out of Kosovo. In the state like uh, this, national Albanian uh, independent state uh, Kosovo, Serbs uh, won't like to leave. Majority of uh, Serbs will uh, move uh, away because uh, not existing uh, guarantees uh, for their lives. And you Albanians wanted the Serbian suppression to stop. If not, you would fight for full independence. We are asking from them to apologize for killings and massacres of our brothers and sisters by the Serbian regime which you chose, which you brought to power. We could all feel the divide between you. But for the first time, you had a chance to listen to each other's stories. Very often, Albanians talk about independence in such a way that they scare the shit out of the Serbs. No, no, no. no, no. no, no. Wait, 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 wait. I'm not saying that you are, have that no, no. intention. It is perceived that way. You're right that it is perceived by Serbs like that. And I could only comment that we fear of things that we have inside of us. So the way we treated somebody could return back. And yeah. that's the fear. That's that fear. The meeting lasted for three days and you decided to keep the dialogue going when you returned to Pristina. But then everything changed. NATO bombed Serbia and Kosovo. All of you disappeared. I never got a chance to show you the film that I made. I know the war ended with Albanian victory and Serbian defeat. But what happened to you? Where are you now? I wonder how you're doing and if you would like to meet again. John, it's, uh, it's very, very, very nice to see you, talk to you again. I, I have lived in Kosovo ever since we were nightclubbing 10 years ago. 
I live in Kosovska Kamenica. I work as a teacher here and I am very, very happy that you actually found me. I never thought I would see you living in the countryside, Boban. What happened? When you come in a village in Kosovo today, Serbian village, you would see people which definitely don't belong there. They just were from the city, but now are forced to live on a village. As I understood, you want to try to, to make some reunion and if you succeed, I'm very, very happy that I will see you and the rest of the guys from that project, the previous one. I'm trying to find all the Serbs from 99. Do you remember Sergeant? Do you know if he's still living in Kosovo? Yes, John, I saw you on Facebook and uh, I was very, how to say, surprised when I saw um, that you sent me a message uh, to me. And uh, I was very curious because of your idea, idea that we again can meet each other, you know, after 11 years, actually after 10 years. At 1999, I left uh, Pristina because my flat used to be occupied by Albanians at that period. At the moment, I'm living in Gračanica. That is Serbian village, seven kilometers away from Pristina. I learned that your town is the largest Serbian enclave. Here living 35,000 Serbs at the moment. Life is very difficult here because we don't have infrastructure actually. And we have here improvisation of our life because people it's not quite sure here are they will uh, stay and live here or they will uh, leave uh, to Serbia. And what about Sasha and Diana? Do you know what happened to them? I live in Belgrade now. I work in a hospital in Belgrade and from time to time in Serb hospital in near Pristina. Now I live in Belgrade. I do a lot of things. Some, some are nice, some are not nice, but uh, basically I have to make uh, everything in 10 years which I lost in one day in uh, June 99. In 99, you were 10 Serbs who joined the meeting. I have found seven of you. None of you live in Pristina, and only two of you live in Kosovo. I talked to Natasha. She lives in Denmark now. Yes, I am a Serb from Kosovo. Part of me will always have that longing in myself 
Uh, for Kosovo. I also sadly learned that Cleopatra is dead. She committed suicide in 2003. So what about the Albanian side? How are you? I remember when we last met in 99, you came to the meeting full of fear and anger. For you it was a matter of life and death to get your message out. I know that during the war, Albanians were forced out of Pristina. What happened? Did you return? And how is life now when you got your independence? Years, I mean, very dramatic and uh, doing a lot. As the bombing started, you had to leave Pristina for Macedonia, but then you returned. I uh, came back in Pristina and I decided to, to create my own political party. When I was 16, I, I was convinced that I'm, I'll become a prime minister of, of my country. My society today is run by people who has no idea on what's statehood, what's democracy, what's freedom. It's not a society of equal chances. What about Fitim? Did he come back after the war? Hi, Jung. It's wonderful to hear from you. I am living in Prashina in Dardania, my old neighborhood, where I used to live 10 years ago. Um, I, I am married. I have a son now. I worked for the Office of the Prime Minister for six years. Um, in the meantime, I graduated from the Faculty of Philosophy. So what was it like in Pristina when you returned? We won. We were very happy. And we were, all the streets were full of people celebrating, partying. But on the other hand, it was, it was a mixed feeling of celebration in one side and, and empathy for the others who have suffered. An author. I remember that he was the one of you that was most angry. I'm doing well, I suppose. <laughs> and uh, hope you're doing also well. Much has changed and you probably will have to come down for yourself and see the changes. I've talked to Steiner from the Nansen Network. You probably all remember that he was the one who led the meeting in 99. I'm sitting here and listening to you, and it is as if you still want the other side to understand what an asshole they really are. And uh, if you want to establish a good community, 
Why would you why do you want to be together with assholes? I invited Steiner to join our reunion. Before the war, he was the one who took the initiative to start dialogue meetings between Serbs and Albanians. Even though the future prospects of peace were bleak, Steiner was convinced that it was possible to avoid war. Det jeg følte gjerne ville skrike ut i 99, det var jo at vi har ikke prøvd alt. Vi har ikke prøvd dialog. Og når vi prøver i tre dager å samle 20 mennesker om gangen, og det faktisk har en slik effekt, tenk om vi kunne samlet tusener av mennesker for virkelig å snakke sammen om Kosovos fremtid. Almost every weekend since we last met, Stanner has continued to organize dialog meetings. His method is to combat propaganda by bringing people from both sides together so they can tell the truth about their lives. Back then he challenged you not to fall back into all rhetoric. Is it, is it possible, and this is the, this is the ch uh, challenge, uh, to become more self-critical? Because in the moment you start to admit that, well, maybe there were certain reasons for Serbs to be afraid, to be worried uh, in that time period. Then you are inviting them into a new kind of life together. But if you deny that they, they had no reason to be afraid, in the same way as the Serbs keep, they don't really believe all the stories Albanians are telling today. They don't really believe that the Albanians are suffering as much as they do. As long as you don't recognize each other's fears, as long as you don't recognize uh, each other, you know, worry about the future together, you will never make it. Det som slo meg den gangen, det var jo at serberne hadde veldig liten direkte kjennskap og følelse med hvilke kår albanerne levde under. Og jeg føler jo i dag at albanerne har relativt liten forståelse for hvilke kår serberne lever under. Og kunne man greie å bryte og faktisk ikke sant, få dem til å se at de begge er offre i dagens Kosovo, at de begge har et felles interesse av sammen å gå videre, så er det et gjennombrudd. In 1999, it was you Albanians that were pushing the search for an admission that you had been systematically oppressed. Many Albanians were wrongfully arrested by Serbian police. Some of you were forced out of your jobs, and some had been expelled from universities. We are just asking for them to recognize that what they did to us, it was wrong, very, very wrong. I can't see that no one from Serbs is saying sorry what we've been through for more than one decade. The Albanian group was, uh, was so much stronger than our. Well we were, prepared, we well were prepared. unprepared, completely unprepared. And they were fully prepared for meeting. Our, our situation was difficult because we were repressed during those 10 years and every day you heard of someone being murdered, someone being kidnapped by the police. So we, the tension just simply grew and grew up to a point of, of explosion. We, we were surprised. Yeah, we we, didn't, didn't, know we really that... didn't know that in Albanian's community uh, are circulating such, such an ideas. We thought we didn't, uh, uh, in, uh, in our private lives, we never uh, imagined that uh, Albanians, they have, uh, they have such an opinion about, uh, about Serbs, about situation. They were was... very angry. Just a few days after I came home from the meeting, the threat became reality. NATO bombed Serbian Kosovo. Our politicians said that they wanted to prevent killings of Albanian civilians. But Serbian President Milosevic used this opportunity to escalate the ethnic cleansing and forced 800,000 Albanians out of Kosovo. forced out of their houses. There was a terrible amount of fear inside us uh, whether we we're going to be forced out or killed or whatever.
When I saw the images of Albanians standing by the border to Macedonia, trying to get out, I was thinking of you. The bombing lasted for 78 days before Milosevic gave up. International forces moved in and new Albanians could return home. The Albanian Liberation Army and NATO had won the war. The road to independence could begin. But what happened to your Serbs? Some fled during the bombing. Others were forced out of Pristina by a wave of Albanian revenge. Now you became refugees and enclaves were abroad. It was thousands and thousands of uh, cars, tractors, uh, carriages, other vehicles. And uh, I remember when at night, it was deep night, I think about midnight, it was terrible rain, and we stopped in one road cross, and we said, where to, where to go? Who was victim? I don't know. For me, I'm 100% positive that I am a victim of war. I didn't do harm to anyone. I didn't steal anything. <laughs> I didn't burn anybody's house. So for me, I'm very positive that I am victim of the war. In that time, I was kind of representative of the fourth on the ground. Now they are, 1999, they were the victims, so-called. And now I am the one who is the victim. That's why the, I think that the roles changed in Kosovo, overall situation. It will be quite a different approach. In that time, I had to explain to them something, and now they would probably have to explain to me many things. You Serbs got the guarantee from NATO that you could keep on living in Kosovo after the war. But when ethnic turmoil intensified in March 2004, you experienced that international forces were not able to protect you. All over Kosovo, Serbian houses were burnt down. Monasteries and churches were attacked and set on fire. They still need protection today. To visit Pristina is still regarded by many Serbs as unpleasant or even dangerous. I haven't been here for seven years now. Building in the middle was my sweet building. I see some graffiti. Wow, it's ruined. This is my window, the one with the bars. This is my entrance door. This is my door. This was my door, actually. It's, yeah, very emotional. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
since I had real life here. You know, before the war, I mean. After the war, it was just trouble coming here and trying to fix everything. But I'm forgetting it, yeah. But I still hope I can return someday to Pristina. The reunion will be held in the same hotel as last time, in Heisenovi, Montenegro. All of you Albanians will come by car from Pristina. And Boban and Sajan will drive from their Serbian enclaves through Kosovo as well. Rest of the Serbs, Tiana, Sasha and Slavko will fly from Belgrade. Natasha from Denmark. Steiner is coming from Norway. Even though he arranged meetings almost every weekend, he has never taken part in a reunion. Your group was special, since it was the last one before the war. Well, it was in 1999, in summer, when my daughter came and asked me, Dad, are you what we call a loser? She understood that you work for dialogue in a place like Kosovo. And there and then, it seemed like all the energy had just been cast out in a big black hole. Men det tog ju bara halvt år för vi igen var i stand till att samla serberalbanare. Och de mötena gav mig en förnyad optimism. For me, it would be interesting uh, to find out what they are thinking now. They got what they want. So that is my opinion. And it is interesting me yeah, to, they, to find they, out... They now have their Kosovo is without that, church? Is that what, what they want? Probably they are, are they now happy? I sincerely hope that none of them were involved in any kind of police and or army operations. Uh, but the message that would go to them is, is uh, to be more open-minded, uh, to, to, to take information from other sources too, not only from what is being served to them by the Serb media and the government. Sve imamo kraljevske parkmane, ja? Da, da, da. Nata su, znači, da. Ja ste napišao. Aj, joj, baš. Aj, pozim. Ure, da ti smoki. Ona je... Ona je, ti su, ja tebe stalno imam na jednoj slici koja je u fura. To sam sad čula, da. To sam sad čula, da bi smo šla. Ti si na Facebooku, pored mene, na profilu. Jesi dobro, Taša? A, baš je dobro da se vidiš. Evo, upravo stiš. Aj, joj, 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 jo if reliving the past can make present life better. I brought the film with me. But first you will sit down with Steinar, go through the process, follow his method for the second time in your life. I think we will experience two groups that are in strong opposition to each other, with two different realities of reality med två olika uppfattningar av vad som har skett. Och nå tio rätt på är det vanskligt att bygga broer. För det vi slåss om är egentligen att beskriva historien. Det närmast som om det är två olika sannhetsbeskrivelser. Natasha, uh, you go first to Tell what happened to you since last time we were here, March 99. March 99. I remember the situation when I left Kosovo for the very first time, when the bombing started. I left alone. I was uh, together with my son, 
which on that time was uh, five years old. As you all know, it was very usual that bombing was starting about eight o'clock in the afternoon. On that point, I was actually just on a border in no man's land because they didn't want to take me in because the border was closed and they said, you know, you are in a war, you cannot come in. I was there alone with a five years old child. And then bombing started. The only thing what I could do is that I was just looking, bombs fell on, on the nearest towns and just wondering, okay, who of my family are going to be killed this time? And now from this perspective, I'm just wondering, was it worth it? Did we achieve that, what we want? Or is it something just, just happened? I'm actually expecting some answers from your side to, to hear what is going to happen in the future. Can I still keep dreaming about coming back or should I just forget it and, and just move on in Denmark? Me and my family, we were stuck for um, three days and three nights, something like that, on a border between Kosovo and Macedonia. On the border crossing, Serbian police was stripping everyone from ID cards, from passports, even from uh, car number plates just to be sure that even if you wanted to return, you couldn't claim back your old identity and who you were and where did you belong. The moment that bombs started to fall, I wasn't afraid at all. That was, there was no afraid. It was more or less a, a kind of relief at the moment. Of course, there was the anxiety and fear that you didn't know what will happen next, but it was definitely a relief. Yeah. It was a real um, happiness, seeing those bombs, seeing planes, watching CNN, watching BBC, etc. So we have to be frank. I mean, uh, it was very good moments, like after the 12th of, of June for an Albanian. Very, very good moments. So during the war, I was in, in Pristina all, uh, all the time, together with my wife, with, with my family. And uh, it was really tough days. I, a lot of my friends got killed some of my relatives. Then, after one of my friends got killed, we decided that morning to go. A few hours after, after we went from our flat, some guy with a long beard, black beard, with a, uh, ammunition belts came in my flat, and everything was burnt. My books, I had the excellent library, photos, uh, pictures, a lot of other things. So we lost everything in a few hours. After the war, I started working for the office of the Prime Minister, where I worked for <coughs> six years. Uh, I worked there as a head of the, uh, as a chief of the cabinet of the secretary of the government. Uh, I served for five prime ministers, that all five that we had until now. Bad things happened on both sides, uh, we know that. We suffered like a systematic <coughs> repression for a few years. It ended up with the war, with many casualties, many dead people, women, children, everything. And then we had revenge by many individuals, which was like anticipated. Uh, I cannot, you know, formulate like uh, uh, 70 March to uh, to be like uh, 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 violence of individuals, you know, because for no, 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 I think no, like individuals. I meant, I meant uh, in 1999, whereas for 2004, it it was it was a rage which was incited by the by the death of three Albanian children in Mitrovica who were hunted by three or four Serbian guys with dogs, 
and then people got raised. And it was, a, a, again, a state of anarchy for two or three days. And at the end, the result was we had 17 Albanians killed. 11. 11 or 17. 2004, March. 2004, yeah. 11. I, 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 had, I heard the report that it was, okay. was 17. We had four Serbs, was it? Three or four Serbs? Eight. And no, no. I think total it was 19 uh, no, no. victims. It was three or four Serbs. These are, these are Italian. And, and hundreds of Albanians who were like yeah, but by what, what he is saying, and you don't want to agree, is that most of that violence was systematic and organized, no. not done by, by yes. individuals. No. You know what's systematic? <clears throat> no, fit in, fit in, sorry. But um, in this moment, we stop the dialogue and we go into debate about what actually happened. Yeah. And let's finish just going through and listen to each other's stories. They didn't manage to to hurt me, but they did manage to dry me out. When we were deported with the train, that was well, the most horrible uh, time for, for me ever. And uh, after third day, I was collapsed. After that, I saw that I don't have future in Kosovo, and I went to Belgrade. Immediately after that, my born brother used to be killed in Gračanic, Dimitri Popovic. His brother. brother. His brother. Yes. How, how, how he was killed, how it happened? He killed uh, by two Albanians, you know, who come in Pristina, you know, with a shotgun, you know, and killed him only because he's a Serb, you know. From Pristina me. or in Pristina? From Pristina. Yes, but how did it happen, you know? Uh, he went to buy the hamburger with his friends, and they passed by uh, with car, you know, and just shot in that group of children. Right, right, right. And, uh, and shot him, you know, in his, his head, you know, and he... That's 100 years experience around the table. Yes. What it tells me is that there is something about the structure of violence. This is not about individuals being evil. It's a pattern. It's a structure of violence, and the structure of violence very often leads to the structure of segregation. And when you have a segregated society, you allow for the parallel stories to, in a way, coexist. But there is no need on either side to find the real truth. Because to keep a conflict going, you need competing stories. Having done all this work these years, I have listened to a lot of parallel stories. And the one way to approach some of this that we always have used is uh, to sit down and ask each other questions. It comes from the essence of dialogue. The essence of dialogue is movement. The essence of negotiation is to go into a position and defend the position. Don't move. And that's why we very often hear that peace talks are not going anywhere, because people are not willing to move. They defend their positions. But in dialogue, you're not uh, supposed to sign a peace agreement. You're not about, supposed to be ag agreeing on anything. In other words, you can enter dialogue with a more open mind. Think about you know, three, four questions that you want to raise, not to score a point, but because you really want to hear the answer. I remember last time, 10 years ago. Despite your differences, you managed to find some common ground. Is it possible to continue down the same path? Or did the war in 99 close that window? Det er jo nesten som en pendel, fordi at uh, fra 1989 til 1999 så er det en serbisk dominans, en fullstendig dominans. Men fra 1999 til 2010 har det vært en relativt fullstendig albansk dominans. Og uh, det som nå vil skje på 
seminaret, det er jo at serberne vil bruke denne muligheten til å fortelle albanerne hvordan de har hatt det de siste ti årene. Jeg vil starte med den første spørsmålet fra den serbiske siden, og du svarer det. Vår første spørsmål er for de siste dekadene, It has been spoken a lot in the media about the ethnic cleansing of Albanians from Kosovo. So we would really like to know how do you explain the fact that 99.9% of Serbs from Pristina has been replaced and moved all over the world? Um, the, the Serb state called for a general mobilization, which means like all able men from 16 to 65 were, were uniformed. Some of them were involved in, in bad things and the others were not. But in general, uh, the uniform makes you part of the action. So some of them know what they did, so they had to leave, and the others uh, were afraid of them. We mentioned that 99.9% .9 of Serbs from Pristina moved. But first of all, it's not 99.9% .9 male. Another thing, it was very many male Serbs not involved in war at all. From I'm sorry, but I had 15 Serb neighbors in my, in my entrance, but a number of them, 14 you, of them. Sorry, were. I have to remind you. Just before, you said that you've been living in an entrance with the military. It's official. That, that means that the highest military officers, of course, yeah. they, be, they were your neighbors, and of course, they've been involved in war because they were. Military officers. No, but no. that doesn't mean not, that the rest of the people... Not my, I'm not speaking of them. It's, it was, that's not my entrance. My entrance was full of lawyers, di directors, judges, doctors. Out of 35 flats, almost 25 were high-level intellectuals. In my, 15 of them were Serb, and out of them only one was not in the uniform. On yeah, okay, but even if we accept that fact... Okay. Um, it is not 99.9%. We, we must accept uh, uh, one thing, that uh, we don't have uh, 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 Serbs in towns. No. And before 99, we had mm -hmm. that. I don't feel good in front of this question at all. Second, I would be ashamed if I would be part of that kind of process. And third, I think that ethnic cleansing is something organized and realized by state. And I don't think that, that was the case in, in Kosovo. Don't, don't take me wrong. I don't think we did enough for you. The absence of Serbian people in cities, for me as a future Prime Minister of Kosovo, would be the most difficult question. But at least we did something, comparing to, to, to Serbs until 1999. You know? I guess both of you are looking for that apology that can make it possible to move forward. Or at least the assurance that you share the understanding of how it feels to be suppressed. But it's easy to get stuck in the mindset that to give something, you need to get something first. Do you think that the Serb political elite, 8999, was correct and just? Basically, me, I'm, not, I'm never satisfied with politicians, but uh, of course, uh, it was a very tough uh, time, historical time in uh, all the parts of uh, former Yugoslavia. So I don't think any political elite in uh, that period was uh, correct and right. Yeah. Well, Fiston came with a strong uh, 
kind of apology. He's really sorry for what happened since 99. Yeah. And uh, if you feel no, do you feel sorry that actually what happened in 89, 99? I think, uh, sorry to interrupt you, but I think that we should move forward because our answer on your question is actually in the yeah. next question they are, yeah. they are making. Um, you mentioned uh, before during the day that uh, you felt happiness when the bombing started. Mm -hmm. We were just wondering about how come that you could feel happiness when you knew that there, there were many innocent civils, civilians getting killed on that time. We were happy because we have been part of systematic repression for 10 years, from 1989 till 1999. <coughs> Up until the war started in 1998, there was almost 2,000 already killed people. Yeah, but that's on, an, on both sides, so we cannot, no, we no, cannot discuss not that. We are, no, we are no, discussing only the, the question, the feeling, how come how, okay. that you could feel <laughs> happy? All this, we were not having schools, we were not having... No, you had schools. All of my families and everybody, parents here in 1989 were kicked out from their jobs. Is that a fact? 110,000 no, no, people? No, no, many, many of them. Okay, you don't know, but that's a fact. Uh, it's, it, it's more emotional question just to ask, how can you feel the happiness oh, when this you is, know that I'm your own, to explain own that family not is in danger? But, okay, but it I, was in I danger yes. during the whole time because our neighbors and all the people were killed by the Serb police on a daily basis, oh, so oh. we were anyway endangered for 10 years. And the moment when bombing started, it started the end of something that was going on for, for, for years. Haven't you been afraid for your own family? That it could happen? Yes, I, I've been. I've been. I mean, okay. the fact that we felt relief on the moment that we saw Tomahawk launched from Adriatic tells you a lot about the desperate situation we felt. Yes, I do think that the bombing, it was a positive thing. Because lying, cheating bastards, as Milosevic was, you can only handle them with bombing them <laughs> to hell. But it was not, it was not only him. It was innocent people. But the innocent people, they were dying on every day. Albanian innocent people from Serb police in Kosovo. Listen, there is no excuse for either side. There is no excuse for any single crime. We can explain all day long here. So but there is no excuse for a single one. So but you if you're talking, that you, we should have continued like we were in 1998. No, we should just. If we are talking about killing civilians, we no, should no. avoid Albanian, you think Serbian, that the, uh, just civilians. Just civilians. Repression that was ongoing. You okay, think civilians were. Okay, just let, can you make your answers? Civilians were being killed even before bombing on both sides. Not, not on the scale that we had. You had few. There is no excuse for a single one. No, but wait a second. If you break down the 2,000 that were killed before bombing started 24th of March, how do you break those 2,000 down between Serbs and Albanians? Those 190 90 to 10, perhaps. Not even 5% of them were Serbs. The, the figure some Serbs quote to me often is uh, around 650 Serbs, so like almost one, one third of that number. Obviously, the gap between the perception is very big. But there are facts, the sources of information. But, the, but, but as long as the sources of information are not shared, that won't have two separate but what, sources of information. These are international, internationally concluded by ICRC and by the well, others. Yes, but let me make a very important point. Because in Bosnia Herzegovina, everybody, all internationals believed 200,000 people were killed. That was an accepted fact. Until somebody said, let's try to figure out how many really were killed. And that was scientific work, and they reduced the number to 100,000. How much do you trust the information given by your politician, given by your, your journalist, given by your teachers about what this conflict is all about? Because obviously the propaganda on both sides is partly guilty for some of these things that happened. But you should say that civilians were being killed before and after, and there is no excuse for any kill. There is, there is an excuse in the international communities, and the excuse is just war. Oh, that's not an excuse. No, uh, you don't think it's an excuse, but that is the official excuse. That's an so, explanation. The international community, they decide to, to go to war in 99. All right, so the real interesting but impossible question to ask, did they stop something from getting even worse? Would we have seen a new Bosnia-Herzegovina and Kosovo, or would we not? 
what is so sad in a way, we cannot turn back and then not bomb and see how that would go. Because that would have been a kind of an interesting exercise. But people believe they did the right thing, and Albanians are very happy. I understand them completely, because if someone, Russia and China, now start bombing Pristina and Tirana, we would feel relief. Oh. So I understand them completely for that. I you wouldn't. I would. It's not a good parallel. But let's but, say, uh, I mean, you have kind of relief you no, felt. You I understand have, that kind you, of relief. You have the right to hate. I mean, you you can not, hate me. I, mean, I, I cannot. Never, never fits me. No, no, you have the right. I know you cannot, because nobody can hate me. <laughs>
this is my chance to show you the film from 99. When I came home, I had to finish it in a hurry. It was screened two weeks into the war. You never saw it then or later. How have you changed? Who have you become? Will seeing yourself from back then change the way you think today? I can't see that no one from Serbs is saying sorry what we've been through for more than one decade. The other side wants the same, can't you see that? Because okay. uh, Serbs want you to admit uh, that you've been wrong in the period before 80s, right? I fight for my rights, for my freedom. You won't, because this is not your country, this is not your place. This is not my country. No, no. No, wait a second. Serbia? Serbia is consistent of Kosovo, Vojvodina, Shumadia, Mačva. That's Serbia. Negotinska Krajina. I make no difference between Kosovo and Serbia. I'm from Serbia. You are from Serbia, from Serbia, all of you. <laughs> like uh, this national Albanian uh, independent state uh, Kosovo uh, Serbs uh, won't like to leave because the uh, majority of uh, Serbs uh, will move uh, away in the moment you start to admit that well maybe there were certain reasons for Serbs to be afraid to be worried uh, in that time period in the same way as the Serbs keep they don't really believe all the stories Albanians are telling today. As long as you don't recognize each other's fears, you know, worry about the future together, you will never make it. I'm not afraid of any bombing. I'm afraid for Kosovo in that case. After that bombing, it will take one generation to forget. And that's not the solution. Change. But only, only, only sides change and nothing else. Now we're in the same position. <laughs> As you were 11 years ago. Yeah, yeah. You, you didn't accept to live under Serbian roof, now we don't accept to live under Kosovo roof. So we're gonna, we're gonna ask for some support to, <laughs> to reach our goals. We're again on the beginning. We're again on the beginning. We're gonna need another bomb. <laughs> 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 it's very easy, 10 years later, to, to understand all the arguments from both sides 10 years ago. There's a lot of recognition. There's a lot of, uh, almost like deja vu. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had some insights. Some of the things we said were very prophetic. Natasha. Somehow I, I'm getting a bit uh, emotional seeing this movie, first of all, because um, I'm seeing my friend on, on this film, which is not among us anymore. And uh, I know that basically she is the, the casualty of this war. Unfortunately, I think that one thing that Boban said in film became truth. I mean that a lot of people will suffer. Will suffer and will leave the the country. Frankly, I mean I then I didn't believe that people will have to leave. From those things that Arthur read, we were completely okay to be part of non independent union. But with with conflict escalating, we became more radical in our demands and now today it's unimaginable yeah. uh, to, to live in a, in, a, in a society which is not politically independent. The stakes got too high yeah, and yeah. the point of no return was you know, crushed. Uh, crushed. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
for me it was uh, when Boban said that uh, if bob if bombing happened that uh, we will need like one or two generation you know to to live again you know together in peace and when we were here on seminar actually bombing was so close and we were not aware me i, I was not aware of that and i thought that it will never happen because in that time we already uh, had like seed of multi ethnic life you know it wasn't us that misused the opportunity. It was you. The, the opportunity uh, to, to have bombings or not was on Serbian authority hands, not on, on uh, ethnic Albanian hands. Key of success was in your hand, you know, because you went all around the world, you know, and talking that you don't have freedom, etc., etc., you know. When we, when we, where we move this but regime, we can sit and talk, you know. No, for you, it was very, very much easiest, you know, to go and to tell to some powerful country, you no, know, listen, that... It's, this is a matter of trust. You, as a group, and in the in, in eyes of Albanians as a group, we didn't have any trust anymore. It's not fair to, to, to blame on us, why didn't we trust the minority part of, of Serbs that one day they will gain against Milosevic? Up to March 99, the Serb had a kind of um, upper hand. Uh, they were in a position to exert power and authority. And with that comes also responsibility. Albanians are now in, in kind of a position to exert authority. And I hope they don't miss the chance to learn from uh, missed lessons that 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 that, that uh, Serbs uh, didn't get. So with power comes the responsibility. But then I have one question, and that was Natasha asked if she can move back. That means the director, that's your responsibility because it's you who is having the, the power now to make a change. And you know it's in your hands. It is, yeah. it is. So, yeah, yeah, responsibility is ours. I just want uh, to honor what Natasha said to me when I called her the first time. Uh, she said, uh, I feel uh, I have to go. I have to go also for Cleopatra. And uh, Cleopatra committed suicide. It was very tragic. And maybe a one way to honor her would be that we are just silent for you know, 30 seconds and honor her memory. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> 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 
isto sa njim da su čuo da kamenica za mesec dana pravi venčanje. O, tako da skupite se u jedan auto da dođete, to se čisto provedemo. Jel imaš muziku? Da, da, sve ima, žurka je, žurka je, samo tako. Ja ti kažem, moja milijena peso, i ona... I ide samo za pesnika, i mišli je ciganlije. Obavezno, znači i ti biti. Ne znam, poriste verovatno svih Facebook i te zajemance. O, ja ne znam, samo sliku da sam. Nadam se da ćete da uspjeti dalje. Sada što mi jako mi je bilo drago da smo se opet vidjeli i da smo se sada upoznali. Meni također. I kako imaš? Definitivno je bilo zadovoljstvo. Ako budeš došla dalje, onda... Želim da postaneš. Ako postane... Onda će da bude premijer. Nadam se da ćeš da postaneš premijer, definitivno. Biće dobro za svi. Pa da pa se vidimo, pa se čujem, mislim, kad god bude došli u Prištini ili hoćete da dolazite, mislim, zovite, pošto... Znaš. Ajde, čao. Molim vas sve. Čao. Could this be the start of a new beginning? In my opinion, something happened in that room. Before we say goodbye, I think we are all wondering, in 10 years time, will you remember the words you gave to each other?
talk and then maybe to have some Q&A time at the end as well. So I'll turn off the screen. So any kind of comment, reflection, question? I, uh, we had a session earlier today and uh, I was stressing over and over again that all these stupid professors say, so what's the question? Instead of saying, you know, take some time and think through what would be uh, important to ask.
And so all the things I work with is like never-ending stories. <laughs> like also is a never-ending story. It's not going to be fixed in, in the next five years or the next ten years. But I think it can be fixed. And there is enough of those individual moments <coughs> where I meet people that somehow stand up and say things and even just say that, you know, meeting somebody from the other side changed my life. Uh, I, I like to tell the story about I invited five Palestinian women filmmakers and five Israeli film filmmakers, also women. And the Palestinians didn't want to come because that meant to, to respect and honor in ways they didn't want to. So I went down to Bethlehem and I sat with them for a day. Do you think Israelis know the truth about you? How you live? Do they know enough? Do the journalists tell the truth? Do the teachers tell the truth? Do the politicians tell the truth? No, 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 no. Well, shouldn't somebody tell them? Shouldn't you show your movies? And they said, of course. But is that dialogue? I said, yes. Dialogue is showing yourself to others and allow others to show themselves to you. And they said, oh, but we thought dialogue was what was going on at Camp David. No, no, that's political communication, which is almost the opposite of dialogue. <laughs> and then said, okay, but that will come. But just promise one thing, don't call it dialogue. So I called it other voices because dialogue is being used and abused a little bit too much. But the point of this story was that when a 44 woman from Nablus saw the first Israeli movie, she got up and she said, I'm so ashamed to say that this is the first Israeli movie I've seen in my life and I'm 44 years old. So the consequence of a conflict is very often segregation and like now in Bosnia and Herzegovina, is the guy from Bosnia here? Yeah. No. You have a segregated school system. And as one um, parent told me, you know, the problem, Steiner, is not that the kids are fighting. They don't know anything about each other. Because often you have a morning shift for the one ethnic group and you have an evening shift for the other ethnic group. Simply so they are not supposed to meet and, and, and uh, be together. But these small moments that I, I talk about with the woman from Nablus, I have a lot of those stories and that gives me energy. And I really understand I cannot change the world. But I can make a difference. And uh, Amos Oz is an Israeli author. He had a beautiful image. He said, when you see a fire, maybe you don't have a fire truck. Actually, most people don't even have a hose. But everybody has a teaspoon. And everybody can throw some water on the fire. So uh, I guess that's a little bit my, my philosophy, that I'll try to do as best I can. And if you try to do the best you can, and you try the best you can, then all of us together can somehow uh, contribute in a way. Would you like to say a few words to us now? <laughs> I am a Kosovo Serb. I left uh, Kosovo uh, in 1997. Uh, I remember the Kosovo from uh, another perspective. I remember Kosovo in the time when the Kosovo Serbs and Albanians lived together, very close to each other. Um, and that uh, period of time, I grew up and uh, I studied in Pristina, which is, was the capital of, uh, is still capital of Kosovo. And I had a lot of friends among both Serbs and Albanians, and I studied with them and I worked together with them. And I, as a pediatrician, worked with, uh, with the most vulnerable groups of Albanians, with the parents of the city. Uh, my first neighbors were Albanians. It means we really knew each other. Uh, I cannot say that we all the time uh, were in the perfect relations, but who are, actually? Uh, what I'm seeing uh, in Kosovo after the war, I see that I, the, the relations between Serbs and Kosovo are completely destroyed. Uh, I came from the big city, from Pristina. It was 50,000 uh, Serbs living in Pristina at that time. There's no Serbs living in, uh, in Pristina anymore. And not any Serbs in the big cities. 
the small number of Serbs are in enclaves and they really feel like uh, second class citizens without any uh, possibilities to change their life. Uh, my parents are in Belgrade and my father, he's 75 years old, he still dreams about fishing in the lake in Kosovo. And the Serbs miss Kosovo and they are very um, um, sad about everything that happened. Um, I also see the, the young people in Kosovo uh, having the interest to interact. I met them two years ago in the dialogue seminar stand and participated in the deal with and I saw the interest among the young people not knowing each other's language to really know a little bit more about each other and that was very nice to see for me. Um, it is challenging to be Kosovo Serb at the moment, uh, very much. It's also challenging to be the Kosovo Serb abroad because more, a lot of Serbs uh, left Kosovo last uh, in recent years and they are living abroad and they are meeting the Albanian refugees in abroad also. And they are also finding themselves and they are also communicating. They are finding more similarities than the differences and in the huge world they are finding themselves maybe more similar than they thought they could be. And I'm very happy also to meet the one because of Albanian girl, very happy that she got the opportunity to participate in the, this floor in beautiful college. Thank you for your attention.
we involve the parents every step of the way. In 2007, before we opened the school, we had 260 coffee visits. Because we were talking and talking and talking to all the parents. That sounds like a lot, but this was a small village. And <clears throat> it probably was only like 30, 30 families that had the kids in this school. So it's not as if we talked to thousands of people. But those 30 families, we spoke with a lot, so they felt safe. And that was important. <clears throat> because one guerrilla leader was released from prison, and he was like the self-proclaimed leader of that uh, town, uh, Chemsevo. And he said, this is wrong. Children should not go to school together. And he started to put pressure on the school. And uh, he would stop the school bus, force the students off. Parents started to drive the, the children in cars, private cars, and he put up roadblocks. And at one moment, we had to stop the whole thing because we thought, we want to make peace, but we are actually creating danger. Then the parents said, we have a right to decide the education of our children. We want to have an election in the village to see if this man has the support he claims he has. And the village had a village council with nine leaders. And this is an all Albanian village. And we thought, if we get five, we can continue, but it's going to be tough. If we only get four, we will have to close the school. But we got seven. And he got so furious that he took all the ballots, ran out, and we didn't see him <laughs> anymore. But at that moment, this was on the news in Macedonia uh, almost every day. And it was very, very uh, close that it could have gone wrong. But that investment in talking to the parents and motivating the parents was crucial for the school to, to survive. <clears throat> what people thought in the beginning was that we somehow, with our intercultural approach, didn't recognize Macedonia as the dominant state. Because this was what went wrong in all of Yugoslavia. They had ethnic names, all the republics. So after the breakup of Yugoslavia, Yugoslavia was an attempt to create one people, a little bit like United States, you know, create Americans out of everybody, create Yugoslavs out of everybody. But when Yugoslavia fell apart, Croats felt they were first-class citizens in Croatia. Serbs felt they were first-class citizens in Serbia. And the others were second and third class. Like Titanic. And we all know what happened to Titanic. You know, they run an iceberg. So you cannot build a society on the notion of first and second and third class citizens. But in Macedonia, they took the Macedonian flag, the Macedonian religion, the Macedonian language, as official for the country. The Albanian minority was not a minority, it was 25%. So it's a huge population, but they felt like second-class citizens. And after the war in Kosovo in 1999, there was a danger of war in Macedonia in 2001. But there was an awkward peace agreement, which is the opposite of the bombing of Kosovo. And the peace agreement was made on that principle, that all citizens have equal status. But then that had to be implemented. And when we came with our intercultural model, people saw that we were not, in a way, recognized as Macedonian. But the consequence of the conflict was that Turks went to Turkish schools up in the hills. They didn't learn Macedonian. Albanians would go to segregated minority schools in Tetovo, Gostivar, and they would only learn Albanian. And then they would say, we cannot go to Macedonian <coughs> University because we cannot compete. We don't know the language. So separate universities were established in Tetovo. But the consequence was increased segregation. What we are saying is, everybody needs to learn Macedonian. But the Macedonian living in the Turkish part must learn Turkish. The Macedonians living in, in Kostivar and Tetovo, they must learn Albanian. And it's so easy to learn languages when you're a child. I always tell the story about a friend of mine, Luigi. He was married to a Japanese woman. And the uh, mother spoke Japanese to the child, and father spoke Norwegian. But father didn't know Japanese, so they had to speak English around the dinner table. And then 
they actually lived in Berlin, in Germany. <laughs> so she spoke German to all her friends and her brother, Japanese to mother, Norwegian to father, and English around the dinner table. And they moved from Berlin to the French-speaking part of Geneva. <laughs> so by age six, <coughs> We don't know. We will need persistence in many schools. It's not enough to legalize civil rights. You also somehow have to make a culture that's receptive of people living together on that equal base. So now you can say that the Ministry of Education <coughs> is supporting this. It's a bilateral package with Norway. But still, we have to have a lot of cups of coffee with parents in very many schools to make them feel safe that this actually is a good thing. Because if we want to educate children, they need to know the other children in the neighborhood. And we have one subject called cultural and spiritual heritage of the region, which means children need to know the cultural and spiritual heritage of the other children in the region so they can grow up and make educated choices in their life. And to keep children segregated is really a brutal crime toward the children. And when I ask people, why is this happening? Often they say, that's the way it is. But you can follow this now. And, and if you go, if you Google NDC Skopje, you will get three different websites because we have established a training center. We realized we can talk as much as we want about bilingual, multi-ethnic education, but teachers are not trained for that. So we had to build a training center. And we have now educated between two and three hundred teachers in Macedonia for this kind of uh, education. And you can see the website of the training center, you can see the website of the model itself, and you can also see the website of the Nansen Center's copy. I work in, in Norway, we have peace.no is our website. I have brought a few copies with me of, of the film, and uh, a, a book that we have published with different articles about the projects, because we are doing something similar in East Slavonia, in the Serb-Croat tension around Bogovai, we are doing similar things in Herzegovina, in Bosnia Herzegovina, and so forth. So it's uh, very slow, very, very long term, but uh, it's worth watching and following. We're now, some of us, going to Minneapolis to the Nobel Peace Prize Forum. And I'm very happy to, in the audience, see some of the peace scholars from uh, Luther College. So in Anna Nansen Academy, we have, over the last six, seven years, invited peace scholars from Luther College, from St. Olaf, and all the Luther Colleges in uh, the Midwest, including PLU, Pacific Lutheran University in Tacoma. PLU, Peace, Love and Understanding. <laughs> <laughs> this, this year, this summer, we also had the University of Sacramento and the University of Hawaii uh, joining the peace scholars. And uh, it was a very fascinating time because we had 11 people from Russia and Ukraine. And uh, as one of the peace scholars said, this is the first time I heard somebody speak Russian, except Putin. <laughs> and Russia and the United States are so important players on the world scene. So at least if you go to college, your information and knowledge and, and education about these other players in the world should definitely be uh, on, on the top level. And to illustrate, when we have a conflict, we often think we agree on what we fight about. But in East Ukraine, they really believe they have a war against the government in Kiev, because they feel like second-class citizens in Ukraine. The government in Kiev really believe they have a war against Russia, and Russia believe they have a war against the United States. So of course that was an interesting group to have together, Ukrainians and Russians and Americans, so they can talk about what they're fighting about. <laughs> I think we should get ready and get uh, going to Minneapolis. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then all that's left to do is to say thank you very much for making time for you.